Hey everyone, welcome back to Advanced Accounting. In last class, we talked about inter-entity debt transfer. In today's class, we are going to begin talk about translation of foreign currency financial statement. Specifically, this chapter of your textbook will be covered in two classes. In today's class, we are going to talk about the core issue in translation. And we're also going to talk about the two methods used in translation. The first one is called the current rate method. The second one is called the temporal method. So um, this is a world map. And the firm McDonald's, even though it is a US firm, but as you can see here, it is actually operating in uh, different parts of the world besides, besides the United States. So this is actually um, a very common phenomenon um, now. A lot of the firm, a lot of the U.S. firms, they are not really, they are not merely U.S. firms. They operate in other parts of the world, and to deal with uh, these multinational firms, when we prepare the consolidated financial statement, which we learned before, it is not enough. So uh, basically, there are two new things that needs to be introduced here. So if I'm a U.S. firm and I have a foreign operation in Japan that foreign operation when it prepare its financial statement, it is actually preparing it according to the Japanese gap, whatever financial statement, a financial standard is used in Japan. And it is also prepared in Japanese yen. So uh, when we consolidate the financial statement of my Japanese operation, Japanese subsidiary uh, with the US parent firm, actually we need to do two extra steps. The first step is we need to convert uh, the we need to convert the financial the, my Japanese subsidiary's financial statement, which is prepared in the Japanese gap, in, into what should be prepared, what the financial statement should look like if it is prepared under the U.S. gap. So we need to convert the foreign gap financial statement of its foreign operation in, into U.S. gap. And then the second thing we need to do is because that statement is prepared in the Japanese yen, we cannot just take it and uh, add it into our statement, which is prepared in, in the US dollar. So what the second step, what, what we need to do is that we need to do the trans, translation. When you translate a financial statement from the foreign currency into US dollars. And then for the purpose of this chapter, we're not going to cover the first step. So because that, that is actually can be another cause on its own. Uh, for this chapter, we're only going to cover the translation part, which is how to translate a foreign currency into US dollar and to consolidate it with the US parent firm. So as you can see that translation is not that, it's not that easy. So we need to spend even one chapter talk, just talk about translation itself. So the core issue here in translation, I want you to first spend five minutes read this example. Uh, you can pause your video for now. So let's go through this example together. Imagine that you received 100 great British pound in payment, your London sub subsidiary. So you have a London subsidiary. And then in the year, the end of 2014, you received 100 great British pounds. Assume that your consolidated financial statement should be stated in US dollar. So your parent firm is using US dollar. Uh, the parent is under US dollar. And that at the end of 2014, the exchange rate is 1.8. So this 100 translated using 1.8, the exchange rate at the end of 2014, that becomes 180 US dollar. To report the deposit on your 2014 consolidated balance sheet, you would translate the deposit at the current rate and report an asset of 180. At the end of 2015, assume you still have this 100 dollar Oh, 100 great British pound in your bank. And now the exchange rate is 1.7. To report the deposit in your 2015 balance sheet, 
So you have two choices here. This is basically saying that you have two choices here. Uh, you can either use the exchange rate at the end of 2015. So if you use 1.8, which is the exchange rate at the end of 2015, it will be translated into 170 US dollar. Or you, you actually, you can actually also choose to use the exchange rate at the time when this deposit was made, which is 1.8. So that will still give you 180. So can you see uh, the judgment that needs to be made here? Which one would you choose? You actually, you, you have two choices here. Should you choose to use 1.7 as the exchange rate or should you choose to use 1.8 as the exchange rate? So if you choose to use 1.7, then you are actually, you are having a loss of $10. So it used to be $180, now it becomes $170. So you have a loss of $10 here. And then how to account for this $10? That is also, that is another judgment for you. You can either account for it as net income or you can account for it as, as a comprehensive income. So where should we account for it? So basically, there are two issues here that is illustrated using this example. The first one is which exchange rate to use. The second one is how should translation gain or loss be accounted for. And then uh, as for the first question, which exchange rate to use, we actually have three possible choices. So the 1.7 we just mentioned, that is called the current rate. That is the rate the exchange rate at balance sheet phase. So moving forward, whatever, whenever the balance sheet is prepared, that is the exchange rate at that point in time. And then 1.8, that is actually called the historic rate. So exchange rate on the date a transaction occurs. So that's basically whenever that deposit was first made. And then we also have something called average rate, which is basically the average exchange rate over a period of time. So this is in response to the first issue, we have three choices here. And then in response to the second issue, we also have choices. We have two choices here. How to account for this translation gain or loss, which happens if we need to do a foreign currency, uh, we need to translate those foreign currency financial statements into US dollar. So the first way to account for this translation gain or loss is to recognize it as a component of net income. And the second way is to recognize it as a component of comprehensive income. So uh, yeah, so those are the two major issues in translation. And uh, to the two major methods here the temporal method and current rate method, we are, which we are going to talk about shortly, those are just two methods in response. They have different, different responses in how to, so in, in what to choose in response to those two issues. So as you can see very soon that maybe under one method, we use the current rate more or under the other method, we may use historic, historic rate for some of the items more. Or and one method, uh, we recognize translation gain or loss as income, and the, the other we recognize it as part of other components of income. So the two methods we use here, those are just they differ in regard to how they respond, uh, what their responses are uh, to those two issues in translation.